Howdy folks, so this is a uh, follow-up video to the um, buried hard drive experiment video that I uh, posted last and I've done a bit with this drive in the meantime and uh, I didn't film it because filming things just makes it take way longer so I just want to summarize what's happened with this drive uh, since you last saw it. So of course uh, in the last video uh, this disk was not starting up anymore it was basically just giving the click of death. So I worked with the drive for about five to ten minutes after letting it sit for a while and I was able to sort of coerce it into starting and it was detected by the OS and I could see the Luke's encrypted volume on here. I entered my passphrase and the that exposed the ext4 underlying file system but I was unable to mount that file system because the super block for the journal was irrecoverably corrupted uh, and this thing would just return a read error and of course uh, you can't mount the file system at least in read write mode anyway um, you can't mount the file system without being able to read that block so um, and I didn't get a chance to uh, try and mount it in read only mode and I'll get to that so once uh, once that happened I decided uh, that I would maybe power it down power it up again um, and so I, 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 no, sorry, I am starting, now I'm starting to forget things. Uh, when it was powered up and I wasn't able to read the, uh, that super block, I decided to check the smart statistics again to see uh, if they had updated. And I was able to read the information header, which, which has all of the things like the drive, model number, serial number, firmware version. And I was able to read the smart um, error log, which gives you all of the, uh, the errors uh, the last five errors that the disk has encountered, but the actual smart attribute table, the statistics table with all the, the data that you actually care about, uh, it was unreadable and uh, basically um, smart, smart mon tools would just basically report that uh, there was an invalid SCSI command returned and it couldn't display anything. So I thought that was quite interesting. And so then I powered off the drive uh, to reset the controller uh, I powered it back on and it went into the click of death again and it wasn't on for more than 15 to 30 seconds before uh, the drive cut out completely and what had actually happened was uh, the power supply on the uh, the Vantech uh, USB 3.0 dock that this was in uh, actually uh, went into overcurrent protection so effectively this thing went short circuit and so I did a bit of things, checked it, and I couldn't see what was immediately wrong. Uh, the, dry, the, the, the dock was okay, and the way that the dock power supply handles over current is it simply shuts off for about two seconds, and then it tries to restart, and if there's still over current, it goes back off again. So I could see the light kind of pulse on as it tried to start, and it would immediately cut out again. So I took the drive out, and I removed the circuit board uh, from all the mechanics, and I just inserted the circuit board into the dock and the short was still there. So uh, obviously it was not a mechanical issue, at least so I thought. Um, it would be something uh, on this board. So I decided to look at the SATA power connector and of course there's five volts and 12 volt rails on this and I checked them with uh, the diode check and they both are not shorted. They're both uh, a diode drop, they seem to be they seem to be okay at least. There's nothing seriously wrong uh, that I can measure anyway at this point. So what I did was I put it back in the caddy and I got out my Seek Thermal camera and the whole board was of course cold and even though it was just pulsing for maybe like less than a tenth of a second every two seconds, uh, after a couple, uh, a couple seconds I could see this chip was getting hot. Nothing else was on the entire board but this chip was getting hot. Um, not hot enough that you'd be able to feel it, but hot enough the thermal camera could see it. And uh, of course that would indicate that this is most likely where all that power is getting dissipated. And uh, this chip uh, is the SH6950. There's not a lot of data on this, but given, uh, given its proximity uh, over here to this power uh, circuitry and uh, of course these connectors, uh, it's pretty much a dead giveaway. This is the motor controller for the drive. And it appears that this chip has an internal fault. So uh, unfortunately, without a motor controller, there's not much else we can do. And I'm not entirely sure as to why this chip failed because I tested 
uh, all three coils that are in this motor. This is just a, a brushless induction motor. I tested all three coils, and they're all three ohms. So uh, it's not like a coil went short or something. So I don't exactly know why this chip failed, and I don't know if it was caused by something bad that happened in the mechanics that maybe backfed power into this chip, uh, or what, I really don't know. Now, I thought I had another one of these drives that I could potentially take the board from, and uh, you can do this for data recovery. Uh, you just have to kind of know what you're doing, because of course, these boards, uh, you can't just sort of take one from one drive and put it on another drive, even if they're the same model. And the reason is because they have onboard configuration data in either NVRAM or Flash, whatever the drive happens to use. And this is programmed at the factory, and it's calibrations for things like where the tracks are on the platters, things like that. And uh, it's just they're just tiny calibration values. And if you swap the board, then you put the wrong calibration values into the disk, and it may not power up. And um, you, you know you may get the click of death again, but it's not the click of death because you know the mechanics are bad. It's simply just it doesn't know where the track is because the data it's been given is wrong. So uh, a lot of like data recovery services will actually have bins full of boards, all with different config values on them, and they just keep trying them until they find one that's close enough that works. But of course, I was unable to actually find any of these this exact model of drive. I found a lot of 80 gigabyte SATA one disks, but none of this exact model. And unfortunately, um, that's kind of a bummer because uh, swapping the board would be something I'd try. If these were shorted, I wouldn't try, but I thought, you know, might as well. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was kind of out of the question. Now, the other thing that I could do is I could see if the drives I have have this controller chip on them, and I could actually reflow it. I could remove just this chip from the board and replace it with another one from another, another disk uh, and try again. Um, that is a possibility but uh, I'm not sure if I really want to go to those lengths uh, to try and get the thing uh, back up and running. So I think it's probably better to just uh, to just take it apart. Because um, of course, as soon as I take it apart, it's guaranteed to never start again. Because in order to, uh, in order to you know, get these things working again after you've taken the cover off, you know, first of all, you can't get any contaminants in them, although there probably is contaminants in this anyway. Um, my my theory is that all of this corrosion is probably on the inside, it's probably flaked off and it's all over the disc platters and that's what's causing all the read errors. The longer the thing's on, the worse it gets, right? But um, the thing is, as soon as you take these screws out, if you don't get them back on with the exact right torque, you need literally a torque wrench to get it to the exact number of newtons of force, uh, the drive will simply not start. Um, so. And I don't own I don't own such a wrench. I don't know what kind of torque they were originally tightened to, so I have no way of getting this thing to work as soon as I take the cover off. So, um, yeah, I, I, I at this point I'm committed. So let me get my screwdriver, and uh, we can open her up and uh, see what's on the inside. Now my theory as to why uh, there's all this corrosion, um, partially it's because of the bag uh, seems to have had let a little bit of water in. But also, I believe it has to do with the humidity uh, in the air when the bag was sealed. Of course, because I didn't vacuum out all the air, you can't really do that. And um, if there's any humidity in the air, when the temperature changes throughout the seasons, that water is going to condense on the cold metal, and uh, it's going to, of course, form water. So uh, definitely, that is also a big possibility. So that would be probably your bigger worry if you were to do this with something that's sealed really, really well. So what I would suggest is probably um, to include silica desiccant packets in the enclosure, and quite a large number of them. You could also use one of those sort of reusable dehumidifier things, which is basically the same thing, but they have a hell of a lot of desiccant in them. Um, and plus you can sort of take them out periodically and uh, plug them in, and they usually just have a heater in them. And they'll dry out the desiccant for you, so it's kind of reusable. So there's got to be a screw on the spindle somewhere. Where exactly it is. There we go. Okay, I think that is it. Oh boy. Okay, well that answers that question. And I was uh, definitely right about the, uh, the corrosion going all over the disk, and hopefully in the light you can see this. 
Um, it's difficult for me to even look at the camera viewfinder, but there are tiny white flakes look like dandruff all over that platter and that is most certainly what killed this a hundred percent what killed this drive and this is uh, this is kind of exactly what you would see in the event of a head crash right if the head touches the platter it scrapes off some um, some uh, plating dust the dust flies everywhere and the head crashes into it and you know destroys everything well in this case um, the dust didn't come from a head crash, but it doesn't really matter. It has the exact same net effect. So that's most certainly what killed it. And of course, the longer this thing's spinning, the more likelihood you have for the head to hit one of these little flakes of whatever that uh, aluminum oxide, I'm not entirely, I don't know my chemistry, I don't exactly know what that material is, but uh, definitely that is what killed this drive. And of course, uh, what I'm, what's also interesting is that this disc actually parks the head uh, on the landing strip in the center here. Uh, of course, modern discs, they actually have what's called a ramp, which is basically a little uh, plastic piece which sits off of the disc. And when you uh, turn off the disc, the head actually physically leaves uh, the disc area into the ramp. Uh, but this is an older style, which actually has, um, I think it's called a CSS. Uh, a something something strip or something. I, I don't entirely remember. Maybe I'll put it in the corner if I re remember what that's called. Um, but this is a this just sort of that just dates this thing right off the bat, um, and that probably also didn't help um, with the starting and stopping. So, but the, the bearings feel fine. Um, of course, the reason why. It's, uh, it's so slow is, of course, because the head is rubbing because it doesn't have any lift because there's not enough speed. And if I move this, uh, there's, a, there's a release. Doesn't really change much. I can't, unfortunately, really say, uh, I don't know what this is supposed to feel like, but feel, the bearings feel fine. It didn't sound like the motor was really struggling that much. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say that there's anything really wrong with that. I mean this there really nothing can go wrong with this. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's just a solenoid effectively, and it seems perfectly fine. So the ultimate killer of this was simply the uh, the corrosion that you can see that has basically breached the um, uh, the the seal which would have gone on top here, and you can actually see on the seal itself. You can see where it's physically moved across the seal. It's just migrated right underneath it as if it wasn't even there. And that is obviously what was the end of this. So yeah, if this thing was, if the humidity was done correctly, uh, this thing would probably be perfectly fine uh, with those kinds of storage temperatures. And I, I haven't looked at the data sheet for this exact model of drive, but I would suspect that it's probably rated for, you know, uh, probably you know, non-operating minus 40 to, I don't know, 60 at least. So, I mean, it probably always was within its operational temperature range, probably, well, most certainly not its operational humidity range and both condensing and non-condensing. And that was actually what killed it. As to why this chip failed, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, it could have been something happened in here, but uh, there's no there's no evidence that there was anything wrong with, um, actually no, no so I'm, I'm just looking to see, it could potentially be something to do with this actuator, I'm not entirely sure what drives this, if it's done by the same chip or not, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't presume it was anything with the mechanics that caused this to fail, uh, it could be that there, that there's actually corrosion uh, in this chip as well, I mean with water damaged electronics that's generally what you'll see is you'll see corrosion work its way up through the pins, sort of through the uh, the epoxy to the die and it attacks a bond wire or something and it's it's all over now there, this board really looks very very clean so I kind of don't suspect that but I I really don't know why that chip went short uh, it's it's very strange and I think the reason why it kind of starts up very briefly is because this this chip may have its power rails switched by uh, another chip 
uh, or or it may you know try to enable something on the output to try and spin the disk up and then uh, once that happens uh, it fails I don't entirely know but everything looks perfectly fine on this board so the electronics survived and this uh, well did not and of course I'm, I'm not really gonna bother to take this platter out because there's only one uh, there's only one platter so there's no there's no real need to take it off otherwise I'd show you uh, multiple platters but yeah the, the heads are most the heads are most certainly destroyed at this point uh, they've probably been uh, struck by you know hundred and something kilometer an hour uh, bits of uh, whatever this corrosion is so yeah that's what happened it just uh, just corroded nothing nothing more than that and a weird fluke chip failure so anyway hopefully uh, hopefully that was interesting and hopefully that answers any questions you may have had in your head if there's anything more you'd like to know um, of course just leave it in the comments and I'll try and uh, I'll try and answer it so hopefully that was interesting thanks for watching